turn for this morning's session. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Glenn Isaac of Dorkington. I'm the Curator of Indigenous Art here at the Galleries um, and the Curator of this exhibition. So um, this year we've decided to do a few different panel style conversations to give a different level of insight into, uh, I guess, the Indigenous art sector. And um, we're very lucky to have a group, a large group of artists here again this year. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to introduce uh, Barry and Sher from Jilamara Arts on Melville Island. Um, we've got Amanda Dent from Jumapalia in the Asian Whitelands, and we have Will Stubbs from Bukalunga Molka um, in North East Island Land. Um, so we're just going to really talk a little bit and throw a few questions around about um, you know, life on, on an art centre and on a community. Um, so maybe if I just get Sher and Barry just to talk about where you're from and, and kind of uh, you know, how long you've been there. And, um, a little bit of history, maybe? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we're from Chilamara Arts and Crafts uh, Association. We're around uh, an Indigenous owned arts centre on Melville Island, which is 80 kilometres north of Darwin. Um, and within the Tiwi Islands um, is our language group there. So, uh, Melville Island is the second largest island after Tasmania, so it has a, a quite a large land mass. It's about a thousand people on the island. Two communities, 500 in one other community, and 500 in the company where we're from. Uh, and we work in a, uh, an indigenous owned art centre and, and the artists, the member artists, uh, employ me and share to, to manage their affairs, or, um, affairs organise their exhibitions and to, uh, and to sell their artwork. Amanda. Um, I work in the Yankee Wylands. Um, our art centre is called Tumul Banya and it services three small homeland communities, uh, Napari, Kampi and Wadaroo. Uh, these communities only have about 50 residents each, and that includes kids, so they're sort of one family communities. So very different to the bigger communities. Um, we're also the same structure, we're an artist-owned organisation, and me and my partner are employed to manage the business for the artists. Um, been there seven years. And prior to that, I was at Wingalina, which is only 100 k's to the west. So my experience has been geographically quite a small location in those 11 years, um, which is now it's been here. Right, I'm Yep, I'm Will Stubbs, and uh, I work at Bukalarame Mulka Centre, which is the art centre of Yipkar in northeast Arnhem Land, which is in northeast Arnhem Land. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a young country, it's very strong culturally and ceremonially and politically. The Art Centre was established in 1976. It's got a very uh, unusual history of longevity of Art Centre coordinators. I've been there 16 years. My colleague recently departed, Andrew Blake, was there for 15, uh, on and off. And Steve Fox before him was there on and off for 10. And uh, the reason for that is the, uh, the uh, fact that when we stuff up, we don't get sacked, we get educated. <laughs> and uh, the strength of the young to know, uh, you know who they want and what they want them to do and to direct them and, uh, and to leave them to do what they've got to do and for us to stay out of what they've got to do, which is, uh, we are, our structure is uh, as a, Unincorporated Association, no, Incorporated Association of the NT Associations Act. And formally we have uh, five management committee members, two of whom are here at the moment, uh, Gwynby Gunnabata, the winner of the West Australian Indigenous Art Award, is my boss. And his young Tungaya or caretaker, Inamala Gumana, is also a committee member. And then there are three other elder elders. And, uh, but that's really a sham for the fact that uh, we handle things that involve the law and the law remains with the people who hold the law and what happens with sacred things that we handle is at the, uh, under the control of the people who have your authority. And uh, so that hasn't changed and doesn't change and so I have a lot of bosses. <laughs> All right, well, I guess um, from my point of view, I'm interested in the complexities of your lives because I know that working on an art centre is um, often a very challenging experience, rewarding at the same time. And so I guess from starting with um, Jill and Mara Mop, um, I just wanted to 
maybe highlight what you think are the, the biggest challenges for you in, in working and living in a community with an art centre? I believe that the, the art centres are pretty important in the community. You know, they're the social hub, they're, it's, uh, it's an open house for family, extended family, children, cups of tea, um, you know, internet banking, faxes, telephones. We're, we're a business small community, we're you know, 500 people. Um, it's really important that the, that the arts centre exists for that reason of being you know, there for everybody and to encourage new and young people to come through and also for teaching, for teaching children. So um, our bosses, so Timothy Cook and, and our executive team, um, they've been really working hard to, to you know, pass on that cultural knowledge and to teach. And so the complexities of, of organising everything and, and, and um, but also in a relaxed environment. Um, so everyone feels really calm and happy to do it. Um, it, it is hard. The first year, I think, is your hardest year when you're working in the community. Um, getting to know everybody, getting to learn the ways and, and to respect the culture and, and what's happening is really important. We've been at Dillamara for almost three years, so it's not a very long time compared to Will and Amanda, but um, there's still you know, a lot of arts and managers only stay mm. on roughly around two years in, in, in an art centre, but I think uh, continuity is really important for to get that lovely trust and bond and friendship and respect happening between um, guys we work with and work inside. So, yeah, I mean, you know, 99% of the time we're laughing and joking and having a great time and, and communicating and, and making sure that everyone's, you know, really happy with what they're doing and, and, and making sure that we're driving to Lamara for their vision, which is really important. It's not about mine and Barry's vision, it's about the artist's vision and, and what the road that they want to go. So, I think you have to, when you become uh, working in the community, working with people, you you you're working for them. You know, you're not, it's not really for yourself. It's, mm -hmm. it's really important that I think that you um yeah you you, you, you lose a lot of yourself in that sense, and you, and you really become um, family and friends with people that are in the community. So that's that's to me is one of the most important things that I have to learn. Yeah. And yeah. We always we always thought that uh, the role of an art centre coordinator is um, uh, it's probably only 50% art sales or selling um, and the other 50% is social work. Yeah. There is, a, there is a, a lack of help within the community for people in trouble or, or who need to um, uh, simple things like replacing a, uh, a, a key card that's gone missing. Um, we don't have, we have an ATM on the bank, uh, on the community, um, so we deal on the phone trying to order new cards, transfer money from other accounts, from, you know, into families' accounts when Centrelink payments uh, have arrived and there's no card and they can't get access to that money, you know, little things like that. So, you know, in the course of a day there may be you know, half a dozen different problems that, uh, that you get very good at, at solving in, uh, from a remote distance. So. So it's not just about selling art, uh, although that's obviously our, our core business. Yeah, and for you, I guess you live in a diff much different part of Australia as well. Yeah, so. um, Napri is an interesting community because Napri um, has, like I said, 50 residents, and Company, which is only 10 kilometres away, also has 50 residents. Company has a community store and the diesel. Napri has the art centre. So the art centre is the only civic area in Napri that's serviced on a daily basis. There's also a clinic that serves two days a week. Three years ago, these communities were funded by the government and had office staff which delivered Centrelink and other services. But in government's wisdom, they're, they're trialling this spoken hub model where they're throwing all the resources into two communities in the APY lands. And so consequently, Napri now has no office, no phone, no internet. So no services, so it's very hard for the residents to get support. So they're supposed to travel now 100 kilometres to one of the other communities to put their sample for. So the price of diesel is you know, $2 a litre. You know, basically you spend all your money getting to that community if you've got a car. So it has put pressure on the art centre, but because the art centre if the art centre becomes a community office, then our local mob won't lobby. They'll, they'll all be just be satisfied that they're getting the service. So we've said, 
to our executive, to all the artists, that we can't become the office, we can't do Centrelink. We don't have enough time to offer all those services. To encourage them to then go to Aurora, to talk to politicians, to try and get some support for the community. These communities again. I guess the biggest challenge for me is that, you know, me and my husband, we're the only white fellas living in Napri, and so consequently, people expect us to do an enormous amount of work. <coughs> It's really hard to say no to people, mm -hmm. but it's one of those things that, you know, we're also don't have favourites, you know, our, our policy has always been that we're employed by the whole community and it's our job to service everyone equally. And so you can't do something for one family and then say no to the next family. Mm -hmm. So all those things become quite complicated and our mob I know have they have more skills and talents than they choose to use. So they, they could be doing so many more things for themselves. And I find that incredibly frustrating because I see so much potential in the mob we work with. But they just want the white fellas to solve all the problems, you know, the white fellas to, to do all that stuff. Um, so most of the time, it's really fantastic. You know, it's a real roller coaster, like we have real highs. And, and people, you know, are lovely and fantastic sense of humour and know how to live really interesting lives. Like, it's never boring on the community. It's never mundane. <laughs> but it's either like you're flying like really high or you're flying quite low. And it's like constantly this, this roller coaster. And then also constantly trying to understand our mood. Like, it's almost for me like the longer I've spent on communities, the more I realise I don't know. You know, I used to think I was getting somewhere, and then it's kind of this cycle goes around, and you realise you don't actually understand very much at all. Mm. Yeah, I think I've got that. No, I didn't quite have it. It's all these layers. Yeah. What about for you, Will? Oh, look, uh, how long have you got? Quite <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, the last week that we ran the Gama Festival, I've still got my tag on. <laughs> which meant we created a gallery out in the bush by laying uh, 20 square cubic metres of white sand, 40 kilometres from any power, painting 38 trees with white clay up to three metres, installing electricity in a generator and hanging 38 prints that were handmade in our own print shop which has been going since 1996 by young Indigenous printmakers who are amongst the 23 year old people who are employed in our art centre. Then we dispatched three of them in my troopy to Darwin, which is a 12 hour drive, with the stock for the Darwin Art Fair. Then a few of us, including a 17 year old printmaker and artist who, who is currently uh, delivering a talk in Darwin in the Art Fair, which we're also running, as well as opening two exhibitions yesterday, as well as having seven, <laughs> entry, seven entries in the Telstra Award in Darwin, where I was on Thursday night, prior to coming here to win the uh, West Australian Art Award here today and I'm actually on my way to the footy. Last week I uh, got hugged by a billionaire at the same, uh, you know, within 15 minutes of giving an interview to Grand Designs Australia, which is my favourite show. We were following around my immediate past colleague who after 15 years is building a castle on a sand dune in King Island, which uh, look out for that episode. <laughs> and really, the question is, what about the art? You know, what is the role? The real question is, what is the art coordinator got to do with the art? That's the question. Now, why, who, do we make it up? And I am, have a clear vision of who I am and what my role is. I am a dung beetle. <laughs> and what the art of the people who surround me, the actual art, the real art, is to live as an Indigenous person in Australia in 2011. And I see so many varieties of that. And the detritus of that that gets left behind are these things here. That's what they leave behind. Uh, and because they're living in the moment. And they're not hanging on walls or talking about it and crapping on and judging it and comparing it and blah, blah, blah. They've gone. They're living, they're doing their art, which is to be alive and to struggle with the contradiction of life when you do have values of compassion and non-judgmentalism and non-materialism 
when you're dwarfed by this monster that we all represent. And my job is to bundle those things that they leave behind up, to package them into a neat arrangement. And uh, here we are. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it again. But it's great, because normally we are meant to be in the background. And that's our job, by definition, is not to be seen. And that's the way it should be. But it's nice of them to bring us out. <laughs> we do exist and we are human beings and, you know, uh, we are human. We're allowed to have our go and thank you. That's good. And so I guess we've talked about challenges. The other part of, you know, living on a community or spending time on Indigenous communities are the things that reward us and, and the, the experiences that kind of captivate us and, and you know, make us in awe of the people around us. And I, I just wanted to know if there were any highlights for, for you guys. Um, I know for me, I've visited two of these three art centres, so I've not been to visit you yet, but I will get out there one day. Um, and I've had magnificent experiences on both of them with absolute kindness and warmth and generosity and ceremony and lots of amazing experiences visiting these art centres. And I think from an outside point of view, obviously that's a very small um, kind of little taste of it for me. Um, but if there are any highlights that you just wanted to talk about, your time your I think going to exhibitions is obviously the highlight. I think um, you know when we're back at the art centre, we we work in a vacuum, all the artists work in a vacuum there. Um, they don't really sort of understand the significance of what they're doing, uh, or the importance of what they're doing to the to the yeah. to the wider art world um, until they actually go to the exhibition and there's 50, 60 people there, or 100 people uh, all there to see their exhibition, to see their work, to meet them. Um, and had to be complimented about their work. So that's the highlight, I think, uh, because I think it, it, it brings a, um, uh, a greater perspective of, of the importance of what they're doing to, to the wider Australian audience. Yeah, that's, that's a highlight for me. Yeah. And also, you know, there's, there's a lot of highs and lows, there's a lot of deaths in the community. Um, you're actually experiencing a lot together um, uh, and, and sort of, you know, getting, trying to grasp an understanding of of that cultural experience that goes on in the community, and um, you know that, that highs and lows over a period of time just uh, brings everybody a little bit closer. That's, that's the highlight. Yeah, I think the highlight for me is working together. It's a real buzz, and you know when one of the artists does does um, get into a big art award, and, and the camaraderie behind everybody. You know, we're really lucky to have there's there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a a really strong body of, of people that that Dillamara is theirs. They own it, they, they run it, they tell us what they want. And so when everything works really well, we're you know, achieving um, their vision and goal, it's, it's, it's real high, it's great. And when things come off, you know, everyone, everyone's so excited. Um, one of the artists from the park section in Telstra today from, from, our, from our village, Grand Imperial. And the two women danced and sang at the Tulstra stage and all the Tibby that were there for Rayleigh and just seeing her just being so humble, incredibly humble, and, oh yeah, you know, just waving her off. Um, you learn from you learn from that. I mean we you know we attach ourselves to so much materialistic things and, and, and to life when we want stuff, whereas you learn so much from the most simplest things out in communities where you know, just the stars is enough to, to add that bling to your life, you know. Um, and for me, that's a high. Yeah. Walking with Timothy Cook and him telling me a story, someone sitting on a veranda and telling me a story about something. Um, there's a beautiful story between these two men, actually, with the, with the, with the Buddha. Can and tell, tell the I can tell the story? Yeah. Yeah. When, when Glenn came to visit us in Jilamara, um, the day before he came, or two days, whatever, anyway, during that week, we're building a new building in Jilamara, and, you know, Tim and I were walking around and, and Tim found this little brass Buddha. One of those little, one of those little Buddhas. <laughs> and it was really unusual. It was covered in dirt, it was patinaed and everything like that. And he, was, he thought it was really special he found this little Buddha. Then Glenn arrives and lo and behold, there's a Buddha on his side. And Tim was fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> at first I was sitting, like Tim was looking at me really funny. Like, and, and I, I didn't know him. What's going on here? I wouldn't look at anyone, I just wait for it to settle down and, and it was just this really kind of uncanny 
um, experience of him having found this Buddha and then the Buddha arriving in probably a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so it was it was a really beautiful little moment. I think it and, was. You know, it sort of to me painted a picture of things men having for reasons. And friendship. So, yeah, 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 very much so. But I landed here late last night, and I, everyone was here. And I came out of the lift, and Tim, and the first thing he was digging in his pocket, and he pulled out this little Buddha, and he said, "He made that for me." <laughs> so Glenn gave yeah. him a little present when he arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, little nice but a dancing, yeah. a different, different yeah. type. And but you know, Tim, Tim was just taken back with that. And, and they're those highs, and we see those friendships formed, we hear those lovely stories where, where people get such a buzz out of something that's um, just suddenly that's kind of, you know, small and innocent and, and, and whatever. It's just really special. So, mm. but people were really quite taken with Len when he came to Dilma. Yeah. There was lots of stories about, you know, his eyelashes and his eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and and Timmy, Timmy and quite inquisitive, and they're really not shy to open up and talk. Yeah. And, and they are, the island people are a bit like that. They're very friendly. So if you came to visit, they would come out and say, Oh, who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do? And how many children do you have? And do you know? Where's your husband? So, so um, they had that wonderful experience. So when you see people come to the villages and actually, because we don't really get tourists, like you guys probably don't know that, um, and you see people connect and click and, and um, form a friendship, that's, that's great. That's yeah, they're very high. Two are very honest. I remember the room. Uh, is it Magda Zabowski? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, we opened up our eyes and just walked up to her and said, Oh, you used to be that fat woman. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And Amanda, what about you for our final um, tickets? I think the thing that I really love is when the art centre is humming and when everybody is at peace, it's really happy. We do a lunch program at the art centre, so you know, if people have got like, food in their tummy, they've got blankets and all those basic things they need, they can just sit down and do the work. It's a really wonderful environment. And I don't want to be anywhere else. Like, yeah. Coming to exhibitions for me is a really a highlight. I'm most comfortable in community and with the mob and just sitting down in that space and I just love it. Being in the sheds. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. No. Well, there's a lot, you know, every day is a highlight, so the highlights last night was a highlight, mm. it was a huge highlight, and uh, not necessarily for the reason, so in that period of being in art, I worked for a long time, and uh, yeah, I was a criminal lawyer for 10 years before that, and I'm not very good at art or anything really, but I always pride myself on being able to tell when people are lying, or to read their minds as to what's actually going on. <laughs> and uh, I've been involved in some number, large number of art award wins over the period and um, I never arrived at an institution not knowing that we'd won when we had and uh, as uh, the vault, <laughs> the vault likes to call himself, uh, actually beat my radar. And, uh, <laughs> So I, we've been having these convocational conversations for the last couple of weeks, you know, hearings me for no particular reason about some administrative detail, or I try and find a reason to ring him, but we know, you know, we're not allowed to broach the topic of every one or not, but I'm sending radars into his every inflection to try and pick up some kind of bloody hit, so, but nothing. So, you know, a couple of, a few days ago I said, I think he rang me once too often, I think, I think this is a good sign. I'm getting a feeling. And then later on I said, no, no, I was wrong. It's dead. There's nothing there. <laughs> so anyway, it's all going well. And uh, you know, we're happy to come. And... But then, with a couple of minutes ago when they're burning us out last night before the ceremonial opening, um, I just got a bit like Howard Morphy had a silly smile on his face. And I had a look at the silly smile and I thought, hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Oh, yeah. <laughs> shit. That's a silly smile, that doesn't belong there. And I suddenly get a, a bad feeling that we were going to get blindsided. So we just arrived from the airport, we had the didgeridoo and the film, which you normally have to do things ceremonial. So if you're going to get a prize, you have to be ready to go. And that's my job. Basically, I've been in any untold number of circumstances where the elder will turn to me and say, 
get me the 150 metres of rope for the ritual <laughs> turtle dance. Um, <laughs> tell me about it. You know what we're doing, you know what we're dancing, what's wrong with yeah. you? We're at the Sydney Finale in 2009 and, and one of the, Monica, the chairman turned to me and said, mid-dance, he said, okay, get me the paper bark sacred object that we thump on the ground to mirror the sound of Burma dancing, causing the earthquakes. You know, I'm just not, you know, I don't know what's going on here. I may have been here for six years, but I can't remember the dance or the events. Anyway, so we got a bit of corrugated paper and uh, wake a bit of tape up, all was good. And last night, so I'm ferreting through the luggage looking for the for the clap sticks and, and uh, you know, they're not in the right person's bag and they've already started talking and I'm getting this feeling. And so just then I managed to lift the digital do out of its bag and grab the clap sticks and I'm running through the crowd looking for where are the artists, you know, have they gone out for a pizza? <laughs> I finally get up to them, I get up to them and I'm standing behind them and guys, I'm just getting a feeling. I'm getting a feeling. I think I think just in case, do you want it to sing? If you get do you get something to hear? It's okay, well I've got to say. Announcing the winner of the West Australian Guitar Award, Gunbi Gunamba. Yo! Gunbi <laughs> <laughs> goes, Oh! Gunbi gets the Yidaki and they go up, process through the crowd because basically there's a whole lot of white people on the podium who aren't going to release that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was thinking, how's it going to go if it does happen? We'll have to try and kill some minister or something. <laughs> there's no way a black fella could control the actual thing. These guys actually sang it in from the crowd. And anyone who was watching that would have known for a fact that we've been rehearsing that for months. <laughs> 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 Alright, well that's really great. So it was just for us to, to get a bit more insight into your lives and life in the community and, and kind of the complexities of working in an art centre.